Hi, Addison. Thank you so much for being here. I always ask our guests to introduce themselves because I think it always comes comes best uh, comes across best from the guests. So, can you just introduce yourself and tell us kind of what you're up to and and how you got here? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, Mike. Uh, my name is Addison Brazil, uh, and I am a co-founder of the Tether app, which is a men's mental health and well-being platform. I know you guys had my co-founder. Uh, Matt on uh, earlier this year. And uh, in addition to that, I am a mental health advocate and a lived experience expert. Um, I, um, I went through a lot in my 20s. I uh, lost my brother to cancer uh, at 19. I, I found my father after his suicide four years later, and then on the cusp of sort of rebuilding my life and uh, going to the ends of the earth to find the right mental health uh, help that I needed, I, uh, I was in a, a really bad accident that left me relearning to walk and killed a dear friend of mine. So I, uh, I kind of pledged if I could get through that, that when I got to where I was going, I'd turn back and go back for the other guys. Because uh, mental mm -hmm. health, especially men's mental health, is not something that is, um, that was at least, you know, 10 years ago when that journey started for me, that was talked about very much. Um, but then as someone who does feel deeply connected and who has a community around them, uh, I realized how rare that was, and even then, still, how much uh, how much work goes into not ending up um, part of the, the suicide statistics that we see today. Yeah, wow. I I had heard parts of your story um, prior, but you hear it from the person, the source, in some sense. You know, I was getting sort of tingles as you were saying some of those things. It's amazing that you're here doing what you're doing. I think. Thank you. You kind of, yeah, it was really nice. Also, the way you said, um, if I could use sort of, I'm paraphrasing, but using your experience to go back and get, how did you say that exactly? It was really beautiful. It was kind of at a point where I was um, suicidally depressed, which happened kind of once in that journey uh, after the accident. And I, I said that I made a promise to myself that if I could get where I was going when I got there, I'd turn back to go get right. the other guys. Yeah. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps. Um, so can you, do you mind? Um, I mean, that's a lot of trauma. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I found that for this to not take, you know, three hours, it's <laughs> yeah, almost yeah. better for me to just <laughs> say it. And I will always say that I've also been a part of a lot of beauty and a lot of great stuff too. Um, yeah. And, you know, amazing people have gotten me to where I am today. But I figure if I sort of just, you know, let you know why I show up in the world as a mental health advocate, then you can kind of guide it rather than me trying to get through the, sure, <laughs> the whole story sure. of it. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I think what's amazing about people like you is that you sort of found your way through and you're using all of that as, as a way to empower other people to do the same. And also, I assume, to empower yourself. And maybe, yeah, I, you know, I guess in the sake of time and et cetera. But what is it? I guess I'm curious between your, your personal and also your family, just going through all of that stuff. Maybe, you know, I guess as much as you want or in whatever way is right, just describing the darkness of, of those things and, and what kind of helped you piece everything back together. And then again, of course, then you had the accident. So there's a lot there and I, I'm deeply yeah. fascinated and inspired by people sharing these things. So you can go as long as you want. I love sitting here and listening and I, I think <laughs> other people do too, to be honest, yeah. Of course. Um yeah, I mean, I, I think that the number one thing I'd be doing a disservice if in sharing the story, especially for other people listening, if I didn't share that when these things happened, even right up to the accident, losing my brother, um, you know, my dad's suicide, and then losing my friend in the accident, and sort of for the first time dealing with chronic pain, and and you know, like just not being able to walk and use my body to change my state and do things that I was so used to. Um, I believed at every point of that journey that this was something I could fix. 
And um, so if I can give anyone sort of a fast track who's listening, it's, I, you know, if I could go back, I would say, you know, stop trying to fix it and focus on honoring it um, and, and just honoring your journey. And that's sort of become my like tagline, like, you know, people joke, like, just name your book that already, because you're always saying, like, you know, honor your journey. But, but really, like somebody who was an A-type perfectionist kind of type to have to deal with this, you know, I was always trying to fix it. It was like, what, what, what's the solution to how I'm feeling? And, and truthfully, like, I don't think there is, whether you separate them as trauma and grief or, you know, compounded grief at a certain point, obviously, you know, I don't think there's a solution to this. I think there's an honoring that has to happen and, and it's a daily relationship. So, um, you know, I also will say 10 years later, yes, I've gotten through at points from a very stuck victim mentality at times in like, a, a, you know, a survivor mentality in the sense of like, just trying to, you know, I can beat this and I don't need anybody else. And, you know, trying so desperately to take control. And then at times proudly from a real thriving mindset. And there's days like today, and there have been recently where, you know, I do feel that I have a healthy enough relationship with my grief and I'm honoring it at a level that allows me to feel like, you know, I can thrive, um, which again has taken a decade, but I think there was a shortcut there is if I wasn't looking to just be fixed, you know, um, I think that that's sort of like looking back the biggest thing. And obviously as I've, this year when we started Tether and, and becoming sort of more formally a spokesperson for men's mental health, like the more I tell my story, the more I'm able to process it obviously. And, and see sort of, you know, where, where it, sh it could have just been me repeating sort of like a, a, a um, an ingrained, limited belief driven victim story and where I can start to go, oh, okay, that's, that's where, you know, a big shift happened. That's where, you know, mindset really did help me or this, the, at this point in my grief journey or um, in my mental health journey, like, this, this was necessary. And I, and I feel like I sort of have really become passionate about, like I said earlier, you know, if I got where I was going, go back to the other guys. So I think like a lot of people have been through what I've been through, you know, you think about coaching, you think about, you know, getting certified or going back to school or, you know, whatever it is like, you know, cause you want to help people because you know how dark it was for you. And, and one thing that was really cool when Matt came up with the idea of tether was I finally got like the tingles and the spidey senses and like, you know, because I was like, yeah, I don't, it was never my dream to be a, a psychologist or like, you know, a, a neuroplasticity specialist, <laughs> like, but all of these experiences have made me feel like I want to, and I need to, and I need to, you know, help people. But then this idea of remaining a peer, remaining one of the guys, but taking that and stretching that as far as we could possibly go with it. So that we could still be in the community and the community would always be just as much for us as it was for every one of the thousands of guys who's joined the app and the community you know that really gets me excited and it really has just been like the last nine months of of building the culture and community of tether like just realizing that um you know i i i thought about like i said like coaching and and you know it, it was just like it was something about trying to transfer the experiential learning rather than the theoretical, because like I was always very smart. So people could explain to me like how your mindset works. People could explain to me the psychology. People explained to me probably 500 times like PTSD and flight versus flight. You know, we've heard these things, you know, it's, it's not really happening. Your body is perceiving it as a threat. Like it, you know, it's almost like, it reminds me of French class growing up. I mean, we just conjugated the same damn verb for 12 years. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it kind yeah. of became like that where it wasn't serving me in the sense that like, you know, where I was given sort of this forward motion experiential opportunities to actually like honor what I was going through. Um, and that's sort of like, like there was always this idea and it might've been self-inflicted or society inflicted, but like that I would get better and then I would achieve what I had planned before this happened. And like this idea that like I was gonna skip, like like all this meaningful stuff, you know, and it's really hard when, 
you know, I mean, this is my brother, you know, one of my best friends, only two years younger, my father, the man that I looked up to, you know, and one of my most beautiful friends that we lost in the accident. And I really lost like life as I knew it at that point in the accident. And, you know, it's like, looking back now, it was like, so you thought somehow those things, you just kind of, you know, figure them out. And then we'd like, we'd go back to sort of this 19 year old and in, innocence and ignorant as bliss, like, you know, where was I? Uh, and, um, and it's not, where was I? It's where am I now? Where am I now? Where am I now? Um, and, and being willing to answer that question, honestly, being where you are now, um, that's 10 years of work. That's not easy. That's, that's, you know, surrender and acceptance were, were not built into my operating system. I can figure this out. I mean, my dad, my brother, when he passed, started a brain tumor foundation for other children and families. You know, I did everything I could to sort of come up against it, to even it out, to, you know, make him a hero, create a legacy. Like there was, there was always this like sort of response you know, if, if the depth of, of loss went lower, then I would try to achieve even higher. And it became dangerous. And, you know, a lot of people talk about addiction and coping mechanisms. And I, I was this sort of dangerous, magical, beautiful, scary hybrid of coping mechanisms where I did all the things we would do in our 20s to kind of escape a little bit, you know, drinking, drugs, whatever it was. But then I was also just achieving at a, at a high level and like hyper intelligent. So it made it very hard to be approachable and um, to really get the help that I needed because it was working. I mean, you know, it seemed like I was doing well and that worked for like, you know, until like a, a year after the accident maybe. And then it got into dangerous territory of, you know, suicidal depression and and, and just kind of being like, hey, with myself, we don't, we don't look at this. If we don't really look at this, if we don't deal with this, then I don't think I'm going to be here. I don't think I'm going to, you know, make it. Um, it was like, it was a game until it wasn't. And that's right around the time, actually, uh, that I met Matt, who you obviously interviewed and um, who, who had quit his job and had lost a friend of his and was going through grief. And we, we actually went to high school together you know, passed each other in the halls for four years, like, you know, never really talked or bonded as friends. But, you know, 10 years later, he posted this post on Facebook. And I just remember kind of being like, oh, I think I think he gets what, what he gets it. Like he's, you know, he's in that weird late 20s. What the hell are we doing here moment? And I just reached out and, and to talk to him. And, um, and I was like, I don't know if you want to, but you know, I, I, I feel like I, I know what's going on and I, you know, would like to talk to you kind of thing. And, and he did want to talk in and, and um, you know, I, I, it was a defining point in my life. Like, you know, and it's the initial inspiration of me wanting to like join Matt later as a co-founder and build sort of the brand and impact part of Tether is Matt, Matt said to me that called the Matt moment um, in my life, but he said to me, uh, I'm just at this place where I don't want to live anymore, but I don't want to die. And I had never had an adult man admit to me or another person really admit to me that that, that was like a valid experience, one that I had been avoiding living in, you know, you name it, I, you know, around that exact thought, anything, anything but saying it out loud, you know, and when he said it out loud, it normalized things in a way for me that it opened up a level of sort of conversation you know, that we started to have. And we created this sort of beta relationship, this peer support friendship around, we were both being coached, we were both going to therapists, we were both, you know, doing experimental treatments and doing everything we could to, to feel like we wanted to be here, you know? And there was just something about us doing it sort of, you know, adjacently. Um, on the same path and sort of being able to speak to each other without either one taking a hierarchy or, you know, co you know, there was like a bit of peer coaching, but from that peer level of, oh, this is something that works, like has worked for me, what do you think that would work for you? Um, and yeah, that, it just continued. And, and when Matt quit his job and, and wanted to build Tether, um, you know, I started, I just wanted to help out. And then it just, 
you know, went one day, two days, three days. Okay, I'm doing this. Okay, I'm a co-founder. Okay, like this is what, you know, and it was, it was, there was no way in sort of that, you know, we were, we were in the beginning of the pandemic and, you know, I was locked away at our family cottage and it was just like, yeah, this is what I'm, this is what I'm here to do right now. And, you know, where am I now? Uh, I didn't want to press pause because I had just done a full physical recovery out of, you know, chronic pain, uh, suicidal depression, you know, you name it, this, this whole grief process. And then the world shut down the second I was free. And so, you know, for me, the pandemic in that way has felt almost like, you know, four years. Um, you know, it's like I was 28 and went out one night and, and you know, now I'm 32 and like, what that, what happened, you know? So, um, yeah, I was, I was so ready to dive in and, and it's just been a really, really, really cool experience to um, connect with so many men around the world and find out what sort of their barriers are and, and, and kind of start to create this this new form of masculinity where it's just, it's not about don't talk about it. It's a, how can I get you to start talking? Uh, what are your barriers and, and how can we do it in a way that's comfortable and organic and like, you know, um, and in a way that technology can help you. Um, and it's, it's been a really cool, a really cool journey. And again, just staying in the community, one of the men for the men. Um, has been like at the forefront of sort of everything we do. How can we make an impact if this was had been handed to us a year ago or two years ago, or even better, ten years ago before it all happened? And you build this support system with this emotional intelligence, and you're a little bit more ready for life. I think that's, you know, the biggest takeaway. And one thing I always say is that you know I advocate for you to build a support system before. Uh, a life event deems it necessary and relatively it always will it may not be at the extremes of you know what i've been through i hope not wouldn't wish it on anyone but of course that's relative to what you're experiencing and how you're feeling your low is your low it doesn't matter what my, you know what my low is it's yeah it's, it's where you're at yeah that's a wonderful saying uh, the saying i like is our bottom is when we decide to stop digging. And mm. I think what makes it so hard for people to acknowledge that, or I love your saying around, we don't need to fix, we need to honor. And yeah, that's what makes it hard for people to honor their suffering is, is that we are just quite conditioned to compare ourselves to everybody else. And it's almost, it's almost, something along the lines of my suffering's not bad enough so who am i to think that i should feel better something like that and that's very relevant to i mean i learned that kind of thought process in the addiction you know alcohol recovery world but it doesn't matter where where that comparison game gets played it's so detrimental to people kind of believing they're worthy of getting help or right. getting better. Um, I really wanted to ask you, as you're talking, the things that really, I think are at the core of so much of this is you said, well, I guess two things and you kind of choose which one first is the idea of surrender and acceptance, which I think is beautiful and so important, not only when we're willing to admit we're at a bottom or that we're really struggling struggling but also on a daily basis and also the because I, I struggle i i spent a lot of time thinking about the idea of sort of the victim mentality versus being empowered by your suffering and mm -hmm. so because it's quite hard when you're in the victim mentality and when that is dominating your awareness it's so hard to snap out of that or to be guided out of that so those yeah I, I guess i'm curious kind of what that process was like for you moving out of that mindset and into you know a more empowered one um, and maybe how surrender and acceptance helped or fit into your yeah you know how yeah you, wow good question um I'd like to ask them, them 
my, to myself as well. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I think they go hand in hand. And I think um, probably the second one and then the first one in that way, um, you know, I, I had a really magical experience um, in the sense of um, I, I definitely like, so weird because you you know what you know now but you didn't know what you know then but right. um the long story short of it is um you know i thought i had i had dealt with everything and then as part of my dad's death there was you know certain legal aspects and um i essentially inherited his divorce and it just there was there was complications that, and and it took very long to um to deal with his estate and and so you know i thought not, not really thinking about it unless it came up or, you know, being right was sort of powerful, I think. Um, and I, I was doing all right, you know, like I was doing pretty well. And then uh, it kind of came back around and that's when um, I was, I was um, summoned to come back and kind of deal with things. Oh, my, my dog. Was, uh, <laughs> sorry, hold on. Okay, let's say hi. Thanks. Hey, there's there's a meaning for this. There's a pattern interrupt here. So I'm grateful for that. Um, but um, but yeah, um, I I was flying back, and and the night before, I just kind of realized how much I hadn't dealt with everything. I was just suffocating on sort of this victim mentality, and just so angry and so rightfully angry in how I felt about it all. And I just like stopped, and you know before I went to sleep, I just kind of said, I need help. And it was the first time I had spoken to God or the universe or in since my dad's death. I mean, I just, there were just aspects of my dad's death and I found my dad and because of the PTSD, I lost, I lost God in the sense of anything that wasn't living couldn't be real because the flashbacks, like God made the flashbacks real, if that makes any sense. Like yeah. if there was God, there were ghosts and I was seeing shadows and like weird things and that really that really terrified me so you know I didn't just lose my dad I lost sort of this relationship with what God was to me and I was brought up Catholic but that wasn't what God was to me at that time it was you know I've always spoken to something before anyone told me to um so you know it was it was sort of this first like sort of opening of the universe or source or God or whatever you want to call it um you know saying I need help and um the long story short of is it the next morning on a fully booked flight, jammed in, just like headphones in, I'm going to play out, like watch movies and like, you know, I'm a victim and it was my birthday week and like I was having to do this and, you know, all this stuff. I had to give up a job and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and right before we took off, the person in the middle seat, which was sort of, you know, making it all so squishy and great for my victim story, um, you know, got up and, and me and the, the woman looked at each other because we had both tried to like move seats and they said there were no seats. And so she got up and she, there was a seat beside her husband. And so she left and the woman on the aisle um, kind of smiled at me and I, I, like, I'm very Canadian and like always polite, but I would like, I really was like, and we joke about this now, but like, I, I really was like, what? Like, you don't even know you know, what, like, I, what my life is kind of thing. Right. I, I don't really, you know, she said something about having clients and, you know, I'm coming from LA, like Hollywood life. And like, you know, I was writing a script at the time and I'm like, clients, oh, who is she? Like, I, I better figure it out just in case, you know, like this, maybe this is, you know, and she said, I'm a transformational life coach um, and an excellence mentor. And I just was like, I just started laughing. I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And so for five hours on the way back, this most beautiful stranger her name's Jennifer Merrifield. She's an amazing, amazing, amazing mentor and life coach and human being um, completely for free. She went through it all with me for five hours straight and just mindset, little mindset tweaks all along the way as I told my story and, and teaching me about accountability. And she, she was the first person to ever explain to me that there was a thriving mindset. Like I thought at Survivor, I was good. I was checked, I survived, you know. Um, but she, she realized how, she helped me realize how much of my power I was giving away constantly. Um, and that how, how much victimizing myself within my story, even though people would argue to this day that I like 
am like the, the victim of these occurrences um, in a way. Um, you know, she really helped me to realize for the first time that, that you know, it's, it's safe to explore the benefit of experiences you couldn't control. And um, to realize that, well, you weren't the victim, you were just left every time, but just left, you know? And, uh, ooh, I just got goosebumps, but, you know, Me just too. left Me because, too. you know, and, and what a privilege. And like, I don't know why it's like making me emotional this time because I do tell the story often, but, you know, just she helped me realize like what a privilege it, it's been to, you know, if somebody's time is up, it's their time is up, you know, and I hated people who said things like everything happens for a reason because I just was like, well, how does that work? You know, why is my brother's death the reason I get to have what I always wanted? That doesn't make any sense, you know, and I wanted to kill them. Um, but, you know. And so moving away from that and the way that she that she sort of started to open my mind and gently sort of give me this opportunity to show up for myself more is like, if anybody was going to usher them out, if anybody was going to be there, if anybody was going to make sure that these people were loved in their final hours and some of the moments, um, ooh, I'm emotional. Um, you know, who would you want it to be? And I and I just like, I was like, oh, this woman. You know, it's like, oh man, fuck. You know, fuck. I'm like totally a victim. And I had no idea, you know. And uh, at best surviving, at best like this independent, I don't need anyone. And I had, you know, kind of designed my life around not like just being everybody's best friend, but not really letting any one person fully into my darkness. And definitely not in like, any sort of intimate relationships where I could be really hurt. And, um, you know, that, that was all sort of just like gently and lovingly opened up, but at the end, sort of every opening in that conversation. And then of course I, I continued to work with her. The accident happened three months later and, and, you know, she came on to work with me through that whole experience as well. Um, every time she kind of opened me up, there was something forward motion oriented, uh, a skill, a mindset, a, a tool that I could put into practice. And for years, I had been going to different types of therapy and different types of modalities. And if it works for you, it works for you. That's great. Um, but what what really worked for me was when this this new idea of you know where and where's your accountability in that? Where's your power in that? And where where do you get to take control? So what happens is the accident and that continues. And, and what sort of happens, and this is sort of like a higher, higher level issue if for people that have been coached a lot. And I love to have these conversations too, because there's so many, I always talk about this. There's, there's two lonelies. There's the lonely you feel when you decide you're going to make a change when you're going to make a big shift. And then you do work and you self-work, self-love, like all this, you know, you do everything that you can do. You meet a whole different new people that are vibing with you. And then there's just like the second lonely because like everybody from before the first lonely, it feels like in ways you're, you're leaving them behind or you're not as connected. And, and you're like, I feel so much better. I feel like I know who I am. I feel like I'm thriving. But part of me wants to be dumb and go get drunk and because I'll be surrounded by other people who are still willing to do that. And, you know, I'm only I'm only 32 now. So, you know, in this time I was in my 20s when that's what you did, you know. So it's just like, you know, it's like this very weird loneliness of like, I don't like, you know, constantly having perspective and being understanding. And, and when somebody does something that usually I'd say they wronged me, I'm going okay, what must they be going through that they would show up that way? You know, what, what must love not have looked like for them? And the amazing tools that, that my coach gifted me with, but there's loneliness in that. And I think a lot of people get on podcasts and talk about how, you know, I changed my mindset and my life changed and my book is 1999. And that's great. And I love that. But also let's, let's talk about how much loneliness still exists in that and how, like I said at the beginning, it's a daily relationship. Of, of tending to that mindset and, and being fair and honest with yourself. And so what happened with me, you know, if you take the operating system I had, 
And then you give me all this knowledge. I was a sponge. Like I just, you know, was sort of an A student about it and applying it. And of course my own survival was on the line. So, you know, but then what it started to become was, was control a new type of perfection around excellence. So the idea was excellence versus perfection. And then it became trying to be excellent all the time, which is perfection, which is control, which is just not feeling good, you know, when the whole point was to be feeling good. And um, this is where, um, and you would get there, but where surrender comes in, and I was at sort of the height of, I was in pain 95% of the time and my hip was broken in the accident and, and um, I was knocked out and my neck, like the, basically my seatbelt line had, you know, kind of affected my whole body. And it was like, there was this alarm just going off in my body at all times, like just like a fire alarm always going off. And my body and my heart and my mind were very logically saying, there's one way to turn the alarm off. And that's when suicide kind of even became the first time I even really realized what being suicidal was. I was always very confused by that because I thought about suicide so much after my dad passed that I was like, I was obsessed with suicide. I thought about it all the time. But, and so whenever doctors or or people would ask me like, do you ever think about suicide? I'd be like, are you crazy? Like I think about suicide a hundred times a day. Like my brain is constantly trying to figure out what the fuck happened. And if I'm next, you know, because it just, it, it, for me, it really came out of nowhere um, with my dad. And um, obviously I've been educated since then. So, you know, it just became this whole thing where I was, I was trying to find a fix again. If I can just fix my body, I'll be fine. And, you know, we've all said that sentence about something. If I can just blank, then I'll be fine. And I say it lovingly because I still to this day, you know, it's like whatever, whether it's a business goal, life goal, a relationship goal, it's like, if I could just this, you know, and all these experiences have aged me about 50 years. And it's so, like, so funny because every time, you know, I look forward to like in, you know, my, a big part of my mindset stuff was around money and the way that I treated money and, and sort of just really not inviting it into my life. And I look forward to as it continues to find me and like my wealth, because I want to kind of be the guy that like when someone says, if I just had $10,000, I can be like, here you go. Have fun because $10,000 has nothing to do with, you know, why this isn't working, you know? Um, and um, yeah, it just, um, it just was really interesting because I had people that I really trusted and I joined this men's group and this idea of acceptance and surrender just kept coming up. And it scared me because I felt like it was too close to suicide. It, it was like, I don't know what I would be accepting because I was more afraid that I'd find acceptance and that surrender was like, you know, surrendering. I'm done here kind of thing and um and it was just like this like horrible to be honest like sort of eight month process of like you know like just like think like you know the way it would be in, in like an hbo comedy of just like trying to surrender like okay i'm am i doing it now you know okay i accept that i accept that i'll always be in pain and like of course i didn't believe that and i was like no because also i was in this whole new mindset of like you can manifest and think anything. So I had this like failure complex around like, why can't I Bruce Lipton, Joe Dispenza this pain away? Like, why, like, am I just not in the club? Like, what the hell? No, like I've, I've been doing like the meditating, I've been attaching myself to the right frequency. And, you know, like I was, I felt like, I felt like a woke failure. You know, I, I, I really did. And, and I didn't want to admit it to anybody because you know, I, they told me I wouldn't walk for however many months and I was up in six weeks and I was like, yeah, like just keep doing this kind of thing. And, um, and it was so weird because I was trying to basically think myself into uh, being able to exist um, and, and how the parameters could work where it could work. Um, and that thinking just started to turn on me for the first time in my life the quality of life just wasn't working. And I was, you know, you're, how smart you are goes both ways. And if you start to value a different outcome a little bit more, and, you know, I was starting to problem solve for, you know, how, how could my mom understand that this is my outcome? Who can take care of her? Talking to therapists and, you know, if something were to happen, you know, I didn't write a will, but I, I definitely had like sort of emotional 
instructions for people that, you know, that it would mean that I did everything I could do. Um, you know, I love when Kevin Hines was actually on Tether this morning talking with Matt. And, you know, I used to say exactly what he said, and it really struck me, but he, I, I used to say this to my sister, who's like a twin to me. If I die by suicide, like launch every inquiry, because like it was a murder. There's no way I'm telling you, you know, and even after seeing it as much as I have, you know, it's just like, I'm like, trust me, like something happened. Like, it's just, you know, and this was the first time where, where I knew I was suicidal. And luckily I got to be very open with that. And obviously, you know, with Matt at the time and men's groups at the time. And it just, it really got to a point. It was the first time where I explored being helped with medicine. I, you know, I, I, I was sort of this independent co-parent from the day I was born. And at 30 years old, I went to where my mom was and let her babysit me for a month and just, you know, said, this is what's happening. I don't know how long I have. I feel like I'm up against it and there, but somehow that what I'm up against is me. And it doesn't, it just felt like this, like we're losing, we're losing, we're losing. And it's so weird, but I just like, it's like, I always explain it this way, but like growing up in Canada with hockey, like, seven game series and you were favored and somehow you lose the first you know three games and then you're fighting for your life and you're just so focused on fighting for your life and then you're in game seven and it's like you know it's a third period and you're down two and you're like oh fuck we're gonna lose we came all this way I've been waiting my whole life for you know to win this to make sure to get to whatever the after of this is and it's the difference of like one goal not being saved like I was in that dangerous tippy toe place and um, it just, it got really scary. And, and my form of surrender and acceptance was through my peers, was through my family, was through my friends where I practiced knowing I had the trust of them around me. And I, and I really had to do it. I really had to trust my coach, my doctors, my my mom, my sister. I mean, I just, I've never relinquished this type of control in my life where I'm just going to let you take care of me and see what happens, you know? Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, Ollie, yeah. I... <laughs> no. You want to say hello? This is Addison. Hey, buddy. <laughs> you are a little bit. Yes. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> Uh, I love thank that. You. Oh god, that's so <laughs> no, but you know what? It's so perfect. The timing of it is so perfect yeah. to just you know have a child. I mean, it's a reason that I got the dog. It's like you have to go back to the basics of you know this is an innocent creature that just wants love and to play. And <laughs> right, the more we right. can spend time in that, you know. And so I, it's so funny because whenever I do these, it's like there's always like it's this variable time bomb that the dog will bark in 95 percent right, of the right. time he doesn't but sometimes when i'm telling my story and i'm starting to feel a certain way and he acts up it's like it would be so easy to go into this always happens to me of course i can't get through my my right. story about what right. i yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. and it's always like <laughs> I, I always gotta stop and just laugh and be like okay here's the opportunity bro like here's the universe sprinkling like don't get up and advocate and then you can't handle a dog bark you know yeah and yeah so it's like i yeah. love that especially like i mean i I've, I've always wanted to be a dad and i'm still working towards like sort of the the final strides of you know just making sure that i'm where i need to be um before i i i commit to that more but but it's like i so i so look forward to going into that opportunity of like fatherhood and just like i'm so glad i started with the dog because you learn a lot um <laughs> yeah. but you know going into it like knowing that those are opportunities um you know and that they're i don't even know if they're interruptions but they're invitations and it sounds kind yeah. of weird but really yeah. they they are and like what could be more perfect than you know these little moments where really innocence occurs you know yeah. and um it's uh yeah so i'm i'm i just i'm always grateful for that and now i'm i'm smiling you know at you know, where I was in that story. Um, and yeah, it's like, I mean, the timing, the timing of that, like to let go, accept and surrender, whatever comes. And it's like, you know, right. like we have yeah. a choice. Today is the perfect metaphor, whether it's, you know, the kids are home, the dog's been acting up, 
you know, the, the wind's blowing like crazy and the power's been going out. Well, let's let's keep recording till it shuts us down. Let's let's talk to whoever comes into our our rooms while we're on air. You know what I mean? Like let's yeah. pet the dog if he needs to be pet. And I think I think that is just like that just has made my job so much easier in this conversation because it's just a practical showing of it, you know. And it's it's also really bringing me back to like sort of like a smile and like that like yeah like you you need to remember that because you have been a little annoyed with the dog today and i don't think it's about the dog you know um the dog's not doing anything different in, in the in the world of puppy life you know uh and it's all centered around wanting to love you too much you know like mm-hmm, if that's mm-hmm. an issue everything else is probably gonna be an issue as you step out the door every honk is directed at you every you know slow driver is yeah. to make you late like these yeah. are things that maybe you can hold on to but like i at that split in the road had to surrender i mean i just can't carry what i've been through and think that the world is against me it, it will it will not mathematically add up to me being on earth it just won't so you know it's like it's definitely out of survival and that's why i just always say the same as i said at the beginning don't wait for something impossible to figure out what's actually possible. Just, you know, start building these things, start having conversations, build emotional resilience, talk to other men about what you're going through and what's going on. And it's so weird that even in the height of everything I've been to, there's always a grounding, normalizing part of it. That's so relative and that we all get, we're all grieving. I just got tangible things that everyone publicly understands I am grieving, but everyone's grieving the way they thought their life was going to go, the job they thought they were going to get after school. Like we're all grieving. And like, I, I am not even going to be Canadian. I apologize anymore. I'm an expert in grief. I have done it for a decade straight at extreme levels, compounded with very close familial relationships. And I, I'm sitting with people all the time. And although society, especially men, isn't gifting them that they're grieving because nobody's died, they're grieving. And to not honor that journey is, like I said, is to go is to go into that fixing mindset. You know, I just need to fix this. And it's like you will wherever you go, where you are, you know, and I love that you you brought up recovery. Have you that book? Have you read that book? I've I've been sent parts of it and okay, it's so interesting cool. when you brought yeah. that up I was like yeah I recently speaking to somebody who who you know has been in a for a long time and he's just at the, the top top of of helping people um w- with recovery and you know I said like I just have I just feel like everything that I did and everything I went through really applies to everything I hear about AA and I I kind of yeah. want to go but I, I I'm not an alcohol uh, alcoholic um or I don't know if I you know um I was just like you know I'm I'm always up to be hard on myself and see what I am but um <laughs> you know it, and and he said to me he said but you're in recovery Addison. like you're in recovery you may balance the vices you may not you know pick one thing but you you are you are in recovery and and in the same way when he says that I feel that when I speak to other men about everything they go through on a daily basis you're grieving you're grieving you don't it's not about this like one you know, thing there, there doesn't need yeah. to be a funeral for you to be grieving. You know, I don't need to be a scientist to, to tell you that. I, I, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that I mean, what what? As you were talking, I'm thinking like, how do we? Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that noise. Somebody above me is doing something. Um, yeah, the, just the print. I mean, you're speaking and and. I heard it from Matt too in certain ways like this I how do we help or encourage people towards this sort of sense of bigger than me you know outside of me and the the I, like the words surrender and acceptance are at the core of all of that and it's so amazing I'm like you know you could talk about that stuff forever and ever yeah um Maybe I'm curious, and and of course the AA rooms or the, any twelve step room in its essence mm-hmm. is about peer support and about meeting people where they're at, 
learning from each other, being responsible and accountable to oneself, but also to others. And at least that's where I learned those words really. And then mm -hmm. through mindfulness and et cetera. Um, but I guess, I don't know if you have any thoughts on how quote unquote normal or lay people or the hyper kind of Western rationalistic, atheistic, my mind and my intelligence is all I ever need to, you know, mm -hmm. be the dominant human on the earth or the successful one. Um, so I guess that's a bit of a tangent, but maybe in, yeah, in Tether no, I... or just in your groups. Yeah. How, how does these sort of deeper wisdom Mm -hmm. ideas get shared yeah yeah um you know it's it's interesting because yeah you can't skip the experiential which is what's so cool about tether is that like you know the guys are sort of like naturally and formally now like in these pods where they they sort of all experience together and i really feel like um it comes down to not not focusing on what's happening but how or the why but the how and how like asking yourself no matter what how can I be in this is very different than well if this was different I we can all figure out why we ended up where we where we where we um where we ended up if someone says you know that when we when Matt and I do talks about peer support which you know we get to do for companies or like within tether or, or with different groups you know, the, the idea of um, when, you know, we, we have the idea, the first pillar is acknowledgement, um, and then it's empathetic and active listening, like let them be the expert of their experience. But that, and then it's about asking questions, but asking questions that are going to serve them and in, in serving themselves. And, and a big one is, is not asking why, but asking how come. Because if you ask someone why, it's basically like, here's your invitation to victimhood, explain to me why you get to where you are right now, you know, versus the how come. And so getting to do that with other people, me and Matt always joke, you know, the thing that sucks about all this and diving into this and getting to talk to experts all the time is that you can't pretend to be dumb when you know better. So when we start to fall back in our own traps, which we do daily, like, and that's something we always say, like, this isn't like, we're good. And now we're, we're coming back for the guys. It's like, you know, making a yeah. second round and this time looking around to see who's who wants to come, you know, it's, it's, it's different in that way. But, but yeah, I think that that idea of just, you know, what's my part in this and, and just how can I be in this? Yes. All those things are happening, but if you just st starting to master how you can be in it, you know, well, I think I'm 10 breaths away from this ending. Uh, and then I can make decisions. I can set boundaries. I can, you know, you know, What's everything that, you know, how come you're feeling the way you are, acknowledging it, and then kind of safety planning, even when it doesn't feel like there's a safety plan needed, but, you know, to get back to where you get your balance and then make meaningful decisions based on it, you know, and it's a lot of it is just that's what we focus so much on checking in, taking a deep breath and doing a one word check in for how you're feeling physically, mentally, emotionally. You do that before you start to talk about an issue or even a positive thing with a spouse or friend you know if you, you you taking accountability for where you're coming from in that moment is so important and then in supporting other people pausing after and doing the same thing and realizing where you fit into that and and where you needed to maybe have some boundaries and you you know that it's it's that playing so it's just like it's it it seems too easy to be true but it takes years of practice but you know, the effort you would make to really truly support another human being is, is near to the effort you take with yourself. You know, you, you, you have to show up in the same way. And the things we say to ourselves, we would never say to our best friend, you know, even yeah. to help them, you know. Um, and I'm pretty close. Like some people would be like, I don't know, you could be pretty real, you know, but like I'm like still so far from the rhetoric that used to, you know. But if nothing else, I can just promise you that at a certain point, when your needs become get tos, when your I have tos become I get tos, when your I shoulds become I get tos, like that was one of the very first things I worked on with Jen, you know, starting to make these little changes and these little swaps 
and it seems silly at first, but when it starts to settle in, you're just having such a better time. The yeah. dog barks and it's like, oh, what is this an invitation for? Oh, what is this a perfect opportunity for? And it sounds hokey, but when you're actually finally in the place where your mind does that, oh, it's like, oh, this isn't, this traffic isn't aimed at me. This is traffic. <laughs> perfect. I got time for a whole podcast. You know, this, it would be yeah. silly for my whole day after how many times I've seen how a whole life can end in a day, you know, for me to let this be my day, you know, this become my day, this traffic or this whatever it is you know it's like <laughs> yeah. you go on and on but it's just it's you know what what's the opportunity here and if you can start to and I want to tell everybody I literally because I was in a state of survival and it, it kind of amplified my my sort of need to change my mindset I literally stuttered stopped in the middle of sentences would say cancel out loud when I would say things that I knew that didn't serve me, when I would start things from a victim mentality, like, ah, ah, cancel, cancel. And like, people look at me like, yeah, no one's recording. It's like, you're not getting another take. And I'm like, this is the only way I'll train my brain though. You know? And it's like, I would. And it, like, did he develop a stutter? Like, no, I just like, I, I'm making sure, you know, that what I say, because I know it's powerful. And, I, and I've seen that now. And, and there's so much that I get to do around it. Um, but yeah. That's, uh, Love that. yeah, it's, I mean, there's so much, you know, we, we've got cool people all the time. And the cool thing about Tether, which uh, is now available on Apple and Android, and that was such a big milestone for us this week, because from day one, we've obviously wanted it to be available to every man and all man, all men and anyone who identifies as a man, um, you know, and, and being able to finally have it on both platforms, just in a technological way, it is actually available to all men now. <laughs> so it's a really cool milestone and, and uh, which I'd love to kind of leave things today with a reminder that we've been doing this accountability pod with a, with a coach named Chris Wilson and he helped me design the program. And it's, it's so weird, but accountability has so much more to do with celebrating awareness and getting things done and taking time to celebrate. Um, it's just like, I did not know the, the value, you know, it was whatever stock yeah. is skyrocketing. Mine is celebration because, <laughs> you know, it's, and it's not planning parties. It's just like taking them to be like, yeah, dude, nice up on time. Like, you know, like whatever it is, it's, or, or also like, Hey, I was supposed to do that. And I didn't. Why? Cause I don't care. Cool. Celebrate. You don't care. We're not doing it. Like, you know, it's like this whole idea of like taking shame and flipping it into something actionable. If it's, it becomes guilt, but then your accountability buddies are there, you know, to be like, well, do you really care? And is this guilt going to turn into a change or are we going to, you know, kind of refine it and move forward? And it's, 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 I can now see how that just works for everything, you know? Yeah. It's like, so yeah. Next time the dog barks or the kids cover the room or whatever, just, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, I'm getting challenged. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity <laughs> uh, yeah no man yeah. i mean all the things you're saying are so wise and helpful and and meaningful and and finding our way there you know it seems to be generally through suffering and and on a daily basis too i, I think suffering is just part of life we don't have to sit in it and get stuck there but it's it's not going away um mm -hmm. and and so how do we navigate that and all the things you're saying were just so from from it's so hard to know what to call it but that place of deep wisdom and and responsibility and service too which i think is so beautiful about what tether does maybe just can you explain a bit about maybe just the journey i guess it i don't know if it's a user experience journey or how men find their way into it and sort of how how things go for people yeah of course so tether which is t-e-t-h-r i always forget you know to spell it um but um when you download the app i mean there's there's different entry points but when you download the app yeah. what you're prompted to do is uh you take an oath um which obviously just keeps the culture and the environment safe of of you know what's going to happen from there and uh, you build a profile, you get to identify, you know, all things that you like and that bring you happiness and also like your struggles. Um, put a picture up, 
And of course, this is all about normalizing the conversation. There's nothing odd about having mental health. I mean, even saying that now just seems weird, but it, you know, uh, obviously. Um, so coming on and, and what happens there is you're, you're able to check in based on how you're feeling. Um, you know, so it's not like this permanent posting, you know, it's meant to be a daily thing and you're able to see either post or see threads that other guys have shared and how they're supported and how safe it is in the comments. And again, like Tether's not there for just on your worst day. Tether's not there and Tether's especially not there if you're, you're in full crisis. I mean, we're not professional help, we're not a crisis resource, but if you're looking for other guys who get it to kind of join you on your journey before, during and after whatever professional help, think about when I talked about me and Matt, where we were, how we were on two roads parallel and we got to have that peer relationship. That's what Tether's meant to be. It's like the willing guide. It's Ron Weasley. It's Sam Wise. Like, you know, it's like, I, I kind of know my way around and I'll show you, but I'm learning too. Like this is, we're not Gandalf or Dumbledore on the, you know, wisdom, <laughs> yeah. you know, looking down and Tether as a brand, as I've built it, that's not what it is. Um, yeah. So from there, we, we have community all call events. We have uh, in-app content, which is all consciously streamed to help guys make an impact in their lives. Uh, discussions, DMs, people bond over different things. And then recently we launched programming, uh, which is like a four week uh, uh, sprint, basically a micro program. We call them the Tether pods. And right now, as a group, they're experientially learning about accountability. Um, again, it's a lot about uh, celebrating and checking in, like we said. And um, and there's just so much excitement coming. We're building constantly and reiterating. And like I said, we just ex expanded. So our family is growing rapidly with the Androids, that, that the Androids, with the Android users that are able <laughs> to join us. So we have um, a monthly event on Zoom for any, any and all members, we have, you know, different types of meetups and um, it's just become a really cool place where there's sort of whatever you're comfortable with, you find your entry point, right? But we're just trying to make it as barrier free and as safe as possible. And it's not what I was saying when I got into the crisis stuff, it's not for just when you're having a bad day, it really is even more so on the good days to celebrate with people. And like I say, bond and, and foster these relationships and connections so that on those bad days, you already have an existing support system, yeah. you know, or on yeah. those days where you're, where you're putting up against your truth, because we're not going to say good or bad, right? Those days where you get <laughs> real opportunities to show up fully. Um, it's really nice when you got another guy to, you know, or five or 10 or a hundred yeah. other guys yeah. to kind of check in with and, and, uh, and move forward. Yeah, that is beautiful. I always tell or remind people that nobody even the most quote-unquote successful people in the world don't do it on their own nor did they ever really and having an army of people around you or one person for that matter to begin is hugely empowering and instrumental in becoming and living the life you know you deserve or that you want mm -hmm. and and yeah, that's beautiful stuff. It's so amazing to hear. I want to not get in trouble by my wife. And so I, I think <laughs> I know what you should later. probably wrap. I know. Yeah, I, I love yeah, these yeah. conversations. It's been so wonderful to listen to you articulate all these things that are so. I'm trying to avoid using the word deep, but that would be one word to describe it. Wise and, and helpful and just beautiful and i want to ask you so just as a point of order i can't remember the, is like all the stuff about tether again will be you know in the show notes and all that kind of stuff so if people do want to find their way there um hopefully they will and I, so i want to ask you one question three times in a row you may or may not have done this before and then i guess we'll just sort of leave it from that so um, Addison, tell me, what brings you joy? Family. Thank you. Addison, tell me, what brings you joy? Humans being kind to other humans. Thank you. Addison, tell me. What brings you joy? 
this is a weird game. I just got overcome. Um, the fact that um, I'm taking opportunities to show up like this. Yeah. Oh, it's hard to be nice to yourself. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Huh. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you, and, man. Uh, yeah, that's so awesome. I hope we get to continue kind of doing similar things like this down the road. And yeah, I'd love that. You guys are really, you guys are really doing awesome shit. It's so cool. Yeah. And if uh, you ever have stuff that you think would be great, um, obviously we're slowly building among everything else, like the content in the app, but you know, and I, I, my sort of brand mandate is if I, if I don't create it, I consciously curate it. So, you know, uh, within our circle of trust, which of course you're in, if there's ever anything that, you know, you're like, hey, I think you guys would really dig this, or you have an idea for something, it is always collaborative. And uh, I, I'd love to chat more and uh, kind of grow together. Okay, sweet. Yeah, right, I man. love, one thing I have to say to you is your fucking hair is amazing. And I <laughs> wish I had, I wish I had, I'm, mine's you know, going away. Like, promise me that you will, that this beautiful. won't end up anywhere, but it's like, it's so <laughs> funny because I never want to talk about this, but like, Every time something bad would happen to me, people would always say, like, and I'd be like, I'm like suicidal, whatever, like going through. Yeah. yeah. You look so good. You know, <laughs> and it became like, I have a very dark sense of fear. It was like this, this I told my mom one day, I said, Jesus, I'm one fucking trauma away from Brad Pitt. Like, every time something bad happens to me, it just, like, if people just keep telling me I look more handsome, I'm like, I'm like, do I want one more? Like, can I, can we get through one more? <laughs> Like, no, no, oh, no. Fuck. Yes, my my dad, he left oh, early, but he also incredible. left some some genetics I'm quite grateful for because you know, and it, sometimes it is nice to somewhat appear like it's more together than sure, it is. Sure, you know, and if, sure, if flowing sure. hair makes you think that you know, through my bad days that I'm just a little yeah, bit there, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll take it any day of the week. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome. Ha <laughs> <sighs> cool okay well okay, thank you man. again i'm so man. glad we did this yeah. and uh me too again, me too so happy for the the, the interruption and the invitations i yeah you know, it was meant to be me too cool okay man we'll have a good All weekend right. and uh until next time yeah